Hello, so I'm going to, I'm going to be talking about anatomical movements and positions here in this PowerPoint. All right, so first I'm going to start with a little bit about like the surface anatomy. Okay, so a lot about these uh, positions and movements um, kind of leads you to some of the underlying structures. Um, so you kind of have to think in a, um, how do I say this, a really kind of like a three-dimensional viewpoint. So it takes a while to kind of get really, really good at this. Um, but so hopefully once you get like these landmarks and the movements, you can kind of get a deeper understanding of what's happening on the joints and the muscles and the bones and tendons and ligaments and everything and how they play a factor and how they move underneath. Um, because one spot, let's say my tendon that runs here and my uh, bicep right here um, is going to be in this position here. But once I abduct my arm, now it has moved up. Okay, so getting a good grasp of some of these like landmarks and ligaments and um, some of these gives you a more uh, better foundation for later on in any kind of medical degree or field or anything that you want to go into. Okay, uh, so really keep in mind on um, if you're, whoever you're doing this on or if you're going to be doing it on yourself or use someone else, maybe like a family member or spouse, whoever it is. Um, that everyone's different in a little way. Everyone has um, some of their landmarks, like bony or whatever, are more prominent in some and not in others. Um, for example, some people that are overweight, you may not be able to see their um, ankle bones on the, on the medial lateral sides um, as a result. So you can't use that bony landmark as a reference. Okay. Uh, same with the creases in the skin. Some people are really, really easy to find some of these depending on the crease. Some are not. Um, so just kind of keep a lot of these things in mind. That was a little different in everything. Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the planes of the body. Okay. So there's three planes, sagittal, transverse, and coronal or frontal. Okay. So these help kind of divide up and kind of give a, a better perspective of some of these, where these movements are going to occur. Okay. Uh, for the first one is the sagittal plane. Okay. So if you see right here, so a plane, you're going to think of it as uh, dividing the body in different sections, okay? If you're going to take and like divide it um, either left and right, uh, front and back, up and top and bottom, whatever it is. Okay, so the sagittal plane, sagittal plane runs uh, vertically, okay? And it's going to divide the body into left and right sides, okay? So if you're going to divide me right here, you're going to divide my body in left and right sides, okay? Uh, next one's going to be the transverse plane. No, this runs horizontally, dividing your body and upper and lower parts. Okay, so I'm going to divide my body, let's say, right here. Okay, so this is my upper side, and then this is my lower side. Okay, and last one is going to be your coronal, okay, often called your frontal. Uh, runs vertically, okay, from right to left, and divides your body into front and back halves. Okay, so a lot of what's important about some of these different planes is the motions that occur in them. Okay. For example, and we'll get more in depth in here in the next few slides, but on like, let's, let's say the frontal plane, okay? Divide your body in front and back halves, okay? So everything on this plane that goes front and back, okay, is where that motion occurs. For example, my uh, shoulder abduction, okay, which was up in here, okay? My arms are just going to ride out to the sides, okay? All that's happening in the frontal plane, okay? Where a lot of the um, motion, like okay, locomotion, like movements, like running and jumping, or whatever, it's going to occur in the sagittal plane. Okay, that's where my flexion, extension, um, all of that is going to occur there. Okay, uh, and then the transverse plane, that is all the rotations that occur: cervical rotation, thoracic, um, internal, external of the shoulder, and uh, supination, pronation, for example, all occur in the transverse plane. Um, so, so like some ways you can divide it up a little easier, maybe for some versus others, where a lot of the massive motions are going to occur in the sagittal plane. Okay. Um, the frontal plane is going to be a lot of your stabilization, uh, motions and muscles. Okay. That have to stabilize for those sagittal muscles to kind of, uh, occur and transverse is all the rotation, which plays a factor of everything. Now, anatomical versus fundamental positions, okay? So, anatom anatomical position is if you see the picture um, right here of the skeleton, 
okay? Uh, they're usually standing or laying on their back, whatever it is. Their arms are to their sides, okay? Thumbs are outwards, okay? Um, legs are together, okay? Feet are, for the most part, straight, okay? That is anatomical position, okay? So for the, for the most part, most of the motions we're going to talk about are going to start out of the anatomical position, okay? And it'll dictate that as needed. Uh, next one's going to be the fundamental position. And that's the exact same thing, except for the only change is the palms face the body. Okay. So if I was here, this is the anatomical position. Arms are at my side. And then fundamental position is here. Anatomical, fundamental. Anatomical, fundamental. Okay. Only change. Okay, so some different kind of uh, deviations, positions um, that we'll talk about. Um, abduction, adduction, okay? The words are, get very, very close together, so make sure that you hear or say them properly. A lot of people, instead of saying abduction or adduction, will say ABDduction or ADDduction, okay? Okay, so um, abduction, okay, is running away from the midline, okay? For example... This is shoulder abduction. It's away from the midline, okay? And then sh adduction, okay, or ADD duction, okay, is some kind of deviation towards the midline. So my arm is coming back towards my side, okay? Adding together. So one way I think about to learn this earlier, okay, aliens abduct you, okay, and then you add together, okay? Uh, next one's going to be uh, eversion, and then there's inversion down here, okay? So eversion is turning outward, and inversion is turning inward. So these are mainly used down at the ankle joint, and then I'll show you, I got some pictures later on, of uh, how the ankle turns inward and then outward, or everts. Okay, so like in, you have an inversion ankle sprain. That's the most common way to sprain your ankle, is an inversion movement, Okay. Um, eversion, you don't have a lot of motion, okay, on your ankle, okay. Extension and flexion go usually hand in hand, okay. So extension to straighten, uh, when a distal, uh, when a part distal to the joint extends, it straightens, joint angle decreases towards zero degrees, usually, okay. Um, and the other one's flexion, okay, is to bend. When a joint is flexed, the distal part of the joint bends, joint angle decreases towards 108 degrees, okay. For example, on my elbow, okay, this is elbow flexion, and this is elbow extension, okay? Um, pretty easy for the most part. On the hip, okay, this is hip flexion, and this is hip extension. And same with the knee, knee flexion, knee extension. Um, It's important to know that, okay, so the definition is straightens the joint angle decreases towards zero, okay, for extension. There's two different trains of thought on this. Um, so let's say shoulder extension, okay? Okay, so right here to there is shoulder extension as defined in um, the PowerPoint. So here back is technically shoulder hyperextension, okay? Because now I am past zero, okay? This is the zero mark, okay? Shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, shoulder hyperextension. Uh, that is very much a um, research definition of extension and flexion, same thing, okay? Let's say flexion, okay? Uh, joint angle increases towards 180 degrees, okay? Let's say shoulder flexion, okay? That's 180 degrees, the shoulder flexion. So once I go past 180 degrees, let's say I have more motion there, okay? That is shoulder hyperflexion, okay? So that is not the um, type of flexion extension that I'm going to be use, utilizing. So I'm going to use the other train of thought of where the hyperflexion, hyperextension only applies when that joint goes beyond that person's normal range of motion, usually resulting in injury, okay? So that is that train of thought that I'm going to go with, okay, to where that, this is shoulder extension, okay, all the way through, then anything past this mark 
will result in a hyperextension of my shoulder, resulting in injury is going to be that hyperextension. Okay. I just want you guys to know the difference be difference between the two. All right, next one is going to be um, external rotation and internal rotation. Oftentimes, you'll see this referred to as like the external rotation as lateral rotation, okay? Because you're uh, kind of deviating to um, towards the outline outside the body. And then the internal rotation or medial rotation, you're deviating towards the middle of the body, okay? So this is just a uh, rotary movement, okay, in the transverse plane, okay? For example, let's see how much you can see, okay? This is shoulder external rotation, and this is shoulder internal rotation, or lateral rotation, medial rotation, okay? Just know that wherever the, um, whatever I'm talking about, as you see I'm talking about, like the shoulder, okay? The motion's happening here, not at my uh, elbow or forearm, okay? The motion's here at the joint that's actually occurring, okay? Okay, shoulder internal rotation, shoulder external rotation. And same thing applies to the hip as well. Okay. Hip internal and external rotation. All right, next one is going to be uh, pronation and supination. Okay, so pronation, okay, uh, does apply to the foot. We're not going to talk about that too much because that's uh, can get pretty complex for some. Um, and same with supination of the foot. We're going to refer to this as more the palms. Okay and the forearms, okay, so for example here, okay, this is pronation and this is supination. If you look at it from anatomical position down here, let me get my camera down a bit, okay, this is anatomical position, okay, and I am pronating my forearms and then I'm supinating my forearms, my forearms, sorry, excuse me, okay, okay, supination, pronation, supination, pronation. Supination, like I'm holding soup. Pronation, like I got no reason to, for you to remember that. Dumping the soup out. Okay. Last one would be uh, valgus and varus. Okay. So this isn't as much a motion as it is a deviation. Okay. So a deviation of part of, uh, part or portion of the extremity distal to a joint away from the midline of the body. And then varus is towards the middle of the body. And you'll see this more when I talk about uh, the knees and some of the different kind of um, variations that those have uh, here in a little bit. So, um, as I said before, okay, abduction, adduction, okay. Um, again, really, really important when you're using this is describe the joint where it's happening, okay. Okay, so it's, it's happening at the shoulder or at the hip or even at the fingers, abduction, adduction of the fingers. Okay, really, really important to know. Okay, shoulder abduction goes out to the side. Okay, shoulder adduction goes towards the side. Um, same, also well, this has a rotation, so just ignore that for right now. Okay, uh, here is the picture of the ankle of inversion and eversion. Okay, so this is like, this is the left ankle. Okay, so inversion, you're going inwards. Okay. In eversion, you're going kind of outwards. Usually you have a lot of motion inwards. Okay. Usually results in that injury, that ankle sprain. And versus uh, the eversion, you usually don't have a lot of motion. Usually it's about maybe 10, 15 degrees. Flexion extension. Okay. As I said before, okay, here is shoulder flexion. And then this is shoulder extension. Okay, here's some of the uh, internal external rotations. Okay, so I showed you the shoulder, internal rotation, external rotation. The picture is not really the best. Um, here at the hip, it's pretty good. Um, even though, like, all the arrows are down here at the uh, lower leg, the motion's happening up here at the hip. Okay, just know that. Okay, so hip ex uh, external and internal rotation, okay, is where all that motion occurs. Uh, here is the pronation and supination, okay? Okay, so supination, you're going to be looking at the palm of the hand, and then pronation is facing uh, posteriorly. Scapular motions, okay? So these can be kind of complex. Um, 
when you're talking about the muscles attaching and like the muscle motions. Okay. But for the most part, we're just talking about the, uh, the scapula. Okay. Or the shoulder blade. Okay. We're called the scapula here. Okay. So on a scapula, if the, you're pinching your shoulders to, together, okay. And that awkward pinch that is called scapular retraction. Okay. The protraction scapular protraction is where they're kind of widening apart. Um, now you got to keep in mind that the scapulas are interacting with your thoracic uh, ribs, okay, which are rounded, okay. So it's not just a straight um, side to side motion; it's more kind of rounding your ribs, okay. So the scapular protraction is your scapulas kind of abducting around your ribs. So if you bring your shoulders forward, okay. Okay, that is scapular protraction. Scapular retraction, protraction. Now, scapular elevation, okay, is when your shoulder blades come up, okay, so like you're shrugging. And scapular depression is what a lot of people really can't do, as you're bringing your shoulder blades back and down. Okay. Now, if you don't have um, really good motion in your shoulders, or you have some kind of muscle abnormality, because a ton of muscles um, connect to your scapulas, okay, or your scapula, however you want to say it, okay. Uh, you have rhomboids, um, your last play factor, even though they don't really attach to it. Um, your uh, traps, your upper trap, middle trap, and lower traps are really, really important for um, scapular movements. Um, as well as there's a ton of other muscles that attach there that play a factor in uh, movement of your scapulas. So if you don't have good scapular motion, um, it's often called scapular dyskinesis, uh, which can result in like pain, um, abnormal motions, compensational issues, a lot of different things just because you don't have this really good um, rhythm of the motions that are occurring. And even for a lot of different motions to occur, uh, a lot of the muscles here have to um, contract and relax. Even for just like, let's say, uh, shoulder abduction okay for this to happen your scapula has to move as well okay so any for the most part most movements of your arm um your scapula is also doing some kind of motion uh here's a good picture of the valgus and varus okay so when talking about like the knees in particularly elbows too to an extent but you're gonna see this more in the knees uh this is like the normal posture okay so, um, I'll, we'll talk about the knocking first, okay? So, this is uh, the um, Jenny Valgus, okay? And then this kind of like where the knees kind of come together and then the distal part widens. This is more of a, a normal like static stance, okay? So, you're just standing and this, this is just how you are, okay? Um, it's more of this valgus kind of deviation is here as the medial parts are more um, medial and the distal parts are lateral. Okay. Now, some people, this is normal, nothing wrong with them. That's just how they are. Um, oftentimes, this is as a result of some kind of uh, <coughs> abnormality, uh, muscle-wise, joint-wise, so forth, that brings you into this. Say, so the knock knee, the genu valgus, is very, very common just because usually people have weak hips, um, tight calves, tight groin, um, so the knees kind of come together. Okay. Where the bow-leggedness, or their bow-legged, uh, genu vargus, varus, I don't know why that's, you know, vargus, it's varus, um, is more of a widening, okay? So their knees, or that kind of medial part, is wider than the lateral part. And so, um, a varus is not a very common um, thing to see, uh, where the knock knee of the genu valgus is pretty common. Because a lot of people usually have a really, really tight groin. Um, their glutes are usually pretty weak, so they can't kind of control their knees. Because your hips control your knees, just by the way. Same as your ankles control your knees as well. Uh, so this is a very, very common stance for a lot of people to have. Especially with females, because they usually have wider hips. And they require more control. Um, back before COVID and everything else, one of the um, assignments I would have uh, students do is... Literally, just, as you walk around campus or at the mall or wherever you're at, watch how people walk. You can actually see them walk 
um, with this kind of like valgus kind of stance. There is another one I should probably put in here called uh, Jenny Workerbottom. And this is actually the hyper extension. So where they're standing, um, if you're looking from the side, their knees naturally hyper extend, just them standing. Um, that's also a pretty, pretty uh, crazy thing. It's not too common. Uh, some people have like, a little bit of it. Um, that's another weird thing that you might see in the uh, lower body. Uh, some anatomical directions, okay, so talking about anterior is towards the front, okay, posterior is towards the back, uh, superior is above, inferior is below, uh, distal and proximal, okay, so distal is farther away, proximal is closer, uh, medial is towards uh, the middle, lateral towards the outside, okay, so anterior in the front, posterior in the back, um, superior above, okay, inferior below, okay, distal is farther away, proximal is closer towards, uh, medial is towards the middle, and lateral is towards the outside. Now, this is really, really, really important things when we're talking about um, one structure compared to the next, okay. Uh, for example, my nose is anterior to my ears, okay, my nose is also um, medial to my ears, my ears are lateral to my nose, and so forth. So it's really, really a uh, good kind of terminology to use once we're talking about like the body. Okay. Again, anterior to the front, also called um, ventral, okay, depending on what you're reading. Uh, posterior or dorsal is to the back. Uh, medial is to the inside, lateral is to the outside. Uh, superior is above, inferior is below. Usually pretty common in there. Okay. Uh, proximal distal. Okay. Actually, this is not proximal distal. Um, so that's another one. Okay. So my elbow is proximal to my thumb. Okay. My thumb is distal to my elbow kind of a thing. Um, some other, other different positions, okay, supine, okay, is usually like laying on your back. Prone is laying uh, face down. Uh, recovery is laying your side, and usually left side lying is the recovery position. Okay. Uh, bilateral and unilateral. Okay, so bilateral is pertaining to both sides. Okay, so I have bilateral shoulder abduction. Okay. And then unilateral is pertaining to one side. So I have unilateral shoulder abduction, bilateral shoulder abduction, unilateral shoulder abduction. That makes sense. Okay. Um, here's some, again, some of those other motions with some, some examples. Okay. Also, they have contralateral and ipsilateral. Okay. So contralateral is uh, positioned on the opposite side of the body. Okay. So right foot is contralateral to the left hand, okay? Uh, ipsilateral uh, is positioning the same side of the body, okay? Right foot is ipsilateral to the right hand, okay? Those are the two other ones that you'll um, commonly see or maybe see people use, okay? Uh, last few things I want to talk about is um, hyper and hypermobility. Um, so hypermobility is excessive joint motion, okay? A lot of people often call this double jointed when there's not really anything I got. No, there's not just thing as double jointed. Just, just, just a lot of people that have hypermobility, uh, more common than females and males. Okay. Um, and these people, they just have a greater range of motion. Okay. It's not good or bad, just how they are. Um, one test for this that they'll see is I can't remember the name of it is you'll take your wrist inflection and you'll try and touch your thumb to your forearm. So I can't do it. So I don't have that hypermobility test. It's just one of the general things I'll do. And the people that are hypermobile can just easily touch their thumb to the wrist. Okay. And that's a, a quick test that we'll do to identify uh, if they are hypermobile in other places. Okay. And then, sorry, the hypermo and then the hypomobility, okay, is uh, limited or decreased range of motion. Okay. 
uh, often this is caused a surgery, injury, inactivity, um, other different reasons as a result. Some people just are, are hypermobile, okay? Maybe they should do some like stretches because they haven't done anything in so, so long. And that happens. Um, the biggest one is surgery and injury, obviously. You ever seen someone recover from like a knee surgery, whatever it is, knee replacement, um, ACL, meniscus, whatever it is. A lot of people often, um, when they go to physical therapy, the first thing they want to do is get that joint back to its normal range of motion before they even start working on strength. Okay. Very, very important things to do. Um, where the people that are have hypermobility uh, usually don't have those issues. Okay. But if they're like if they're lacking, uh, sorry, for those people that are hypermobile, if they're ever lacking in any of those areas, um, usually can result in some kind of um, um, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, result in the body compensating in one way or the other, because because our body is used to that hypermobility, wherever it is. Okay, uh, muscle actions. Okay, so we're going to talk about really the um, isotonic muscle action, which is uh, force is produced in that muscle, muscle tension is developed as a result. Okay, and movement occurs um, through a given range of motion. Okay. So the main ones we're going to talk about are the common ones are the eccentric and concentric. Okay. So let me move my screen over here because you can't see part of this. Okay. So on the eccentric is uh, tension while the muscle is lengthening. Okay. So the muscle force is less than the resistance. Okay. Um, and then the concentric is the muscle it is shortening. So the muscle force is greater than the resistance, okay? For example, on the bicep curls, this is a concentric contraction where the going downwards is an eccentric contraction. Same with the squat, okay? This is an eccentric muscle motion, the going downwards, and then going back up is a concentric muscle motion, okay? Oddly enough, during the eccentric motions, um, more muscle tension is created to control that because you got to think the muscle is actively failing. We're just trying to control the rate of failure. Okay. So often enough, you actually end up using more muscle during the eccentric motions than the concentric as a result. Okay. To control that failure. And if you don't control it properly, it's usually some kind of quick drop um, or you can't control it usually resulting in an injury. Because once you're trying to slow it down, that decrease in acceleration requires an absurd amount of eccentric control. That is one common way that pitchers often um, hurt themselves, is that eccentric control. So it's not the, th the throwing of the ball, it's after the ball is released and slowing their arm down. That's that eccentric muscle con contraction. Okay. And that is it.